Bibles to the book of Philippians this morning, please. The book of Philippians, chapter 2. We have uh, heard and read about the birth narratives of the Lord. And by the way, we do invite the youngest uh, junior churchers to make their way out. We'll help have their parents help them to know who those are. And um, so we looked at the uh, and heard and song about the birth narratives of the Lord. But we want to make sure that we understand what exactly happened at that time. And Philippians 2 gives us some insight into that. And so let's read the text of Philippians, and then we will uh, touch on a number of portions of that text in the time that we have remaining this morning. Philippians chapter 2, starting in verse number 5, the Bible says, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God. I would rather translate that something like, did not consider it something to be grasped, something to be held on to, to be equal with God, but, verse 7, made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself, and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Obviously, Christmas, well, maybe not obviously these days, but Christmas is all about Jesus Christ. It's not about the X that replaces his name, Xmas. It's not that, it's Christmas. It's Christ at the center of the holiday, set aside to commemorate the birth of Jesus Christ into the world, as we said, the most significant birth that ever occurred. And although this holiday has been commercialized in modern Western culture, it ought not to be so in our minds and in our practice in this life. I want to ask a few questions and answer them this morning about the Christ of Christmas. We're going to start with the who and the where. Who are we speaking about here? Well, if you look in verse number six, which is where I'll begin this morning. I'll leave verse 5 for a few moments from now. Notice that it says in verse number 6 who this was. It was the one who, being in the form of God, being in the form of God. Now, think about that deeply with me, please. The mystery of the Trinity. He being in the form of God. Now, the word being, just think about that word. Why does Paul use the word being? He doesn't say who was. He's indicating by that present tense the continuous, ongoing, never ending, never beginning, actually, uh, state of the Lord Jesus Christ in the form of God. It pleased the Father that in him, all fullness should dwell, Colossians 1.19 tells us. And a few verses later in chapter 2 and verse number 9, in Colossians 2, it says, In him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead in bodily form. That is hard to wrap your head around, my friends. He existed before he came to humanity he had a continuous state of existence in the past and through the present as God. Now, when you look at the word form, uh, what, what does the word form mean? Well, it means that which characterizes a thing. We're going to see another use of the word form here upcoming. But it refers to the form that characterized Jesus. That is, what characterized him? Deity. God characterized him. Now, the meaning of that is somewhat debated. I mean, some people want to make it like, you know, Jesus is like an impression. He's not the thing, but he's an impression of God, uh, or he is uh, something outside of God, different than God, but that is indeed not the case. It is, he is the very form and thing 
of God. And if it's not clear, then the next phrase explains that for us very clearly. Notice what it says. Who, it says, being in the form of God, then in a negative, did not consider it something to be grasped to what? To be equal with God. That's what it means when it says that he is in the form of God. This is a very clear statement of utter equality of the Son with the Father. Do you follow me? John chapter 1 tells us in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God, and without him was not anything made that was made, for by him all things were created. He is the creator of all things. And so we can rightly say that Jesus is God. We make that equation because Paul in Philippians 2 says he did not consider it uh, something to be grasped or held on to, to be equal with God. He was equal with God. But the, the mindset is what we're talking about here in the bigger context. But the fact of the matter is that he was isos with God. The same in the Greek. The very same thing. God at Christmas, God came in the flesh. What does it say in John chapter 1.14 about that word of which we just quoted? In the beginning was the word. And the word became or was made flesh and dwelt among us. That word which was God, God came in the flesh and dwelt among humanity. In the flesh, in a manger, in Bethlehem, in Judea, in Israel, in the world. The fact that he did not consider it robbery, as it says here, it's, it's the idea that he was not primarily concerned about his own wants or his own needs, or, or rather, perhaps even better, his own status as God. And the accompanying glory was not something that he considered to be held on to. That is a very almost anti-human attitude that he had, but he's teaching us that attitude day by day as we go along in our Christian lives. Isn't he? Now, I'm going to depart just briefly from the text, this text, and just mention also not, who, not only who he was, the very form of God and the very one equal with God, but also where was he? Where was this one? Well, if you go back to John chapter 13, uh, 3, rather, John chapter 3 and verse 13, the first answer to that question is that he was in heaven. He was in heaven. John chapter 3, 13, he says, no one, this is Jesus speaking, no one has ascended to heaven, but he who came down from heaven, that is the Son of Man, who is in heaven. And then John chapter 3 and verse 31, he says, he who comes from above is above all. He who is of the earth is earthly and speaks of the earth. He who comes from heaven is above all. This is our Jesus, my friends. He is the one from heaven. Jesus said in John chapter 6 and verse 50 that he was the bread from heaven. And he was a man from above, John 8, 23 tells us. But not only was he in heaven, but I want you to think about what state he was in while he was in heaven. Just think about that with me for a moment, would you? In John chapter 17, I'd like you to turn there if you have your Bible, just to, just to look at this little detail here. John chapter 17, which describes something that is almost incomprehensible. John 17, verse number 5, Jesus praying what we call the high priestly prayer, and he says these words, And now, O Father... Glorify me together with yourself, with the glory which I had with you before the world was. Think about the state of our Lord Jesus before he came into the world. He existed in a state of total glorification as God 
sitting with God upon his throne with the Father. Think of, his, think of what was in his presence. The Spirit of God, the angels, the cherubs, the seraphim, the four living creatures, the throne of God, sinless perfection, no lack, no hunger, no pain, no sorrow, no tears. And yet, he decided to leave that glory. Evidently, because he says he had it. And then he prays in John 17, glorify me with that glory that I had before. So he comes from there down to here and back to there in his exaltation. But think of it. He decides and he voluntarily comes down to where we are out of that great glory to a place, as we call, a veil of tears. Think of Jesus. Jesus had a human father, adopted he was, but nonetheless a human father. And so God came in the flesh and had a human father. And you don't see that human father, do you, after a certain point in the Gospels? He's, he's all gone. So God, who had a human father, after that manner of speaking, sorrowed at some point over the loss of his own father. Isn't that something? That was only one of the huge number of sorrows and wants and needs and lacks that he would undergo because he left heaven and he left that glory to come down to be amongst men from when was he? We've seen who, we've seen where, from when. Colossians tells us he is before all things. He pre-existed John the Baptist. Remember what John said? He is preferred before me. Remember, John, John was born six months earlier than Jesus. He, was preferred, he is preferred before me because he was before me. That's in John uh, in chapter 1, verse 15. But then, incredible, it says in John 8, 58, Jesus speaks and he says, Before Abraham was, I am. He preexisted John the Baptist, the greatest ever born among women. He preexisted Abraham. In fact, he preexisted all things because he is the creator of all things. So who was he? He was utter equal to God. Where was he? He was in heaven. He was glorified. When? From eternity past. What did he do? Well, there are six statements, I think, as I count them, in the next verses that tell us what he did. Let me read them again and then walk through them one by one quickly. It says this in verse 7, he made himself of no reputation. He took the form of a bondservant. He came in the likeness of men. And being found that way, as in appearance as a man, he humbled himself, became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. And so I know that we fast forward, we speed through the Christmas narrative all the way to the end, the purpose of Christ's earthly life, to not only be born, but to die for sinners. It says he made himself of no reputation. Put yourself in his shoes. You can't fully, but just think about it. How would you make your own self of no reputation in a righteous way? How would you do that? How would you make yourself of comparatively no reputation? The rest of this text tells us exactly how Jesus did that. He did, now, he did not become undeity. He never lost that, despite some false teachings that suggest that that happened. He never did. He never lost independence or... Uh, use of his attributes of deity, those were uh, under his control and in his person and allowed him to be able to do those great miracles that we've seen over the course of the Gospels and his life and history. But he made himself of no reputation by means of, for example, taking the form of a bondservant. Remember that word form that we talked about? He was in the form of God meaning that which characterized God, he was. Now how is he characterized? He's the form of a God and servant 
at the same time. God and servant at the very same time. He was characterized by both deity and by bond servanthood. Now, if he's a bond servant, who did he serve? Or could I say better, whom did he serve? Who, who, who was it that were, that, that were recipients of the service of the great, utterly equal person with God? Well, Isaiah 52 tells us to behold the servant, the servant who was slain for the sins of the world. Acts chapter 4, two times the disciples there acknowledge Jesus as the servant of God. He is the servant of God. And then in Mark chapter 9 and verse number 35, the scripture tells us that he is the servant of all. The servant of all. Not only of God, but of, of all. And then the Bible adds in Romans 15, 8, that he was the servant of the circumcision. That means the servant of the Jewish people. And it says there to confirm the promises of God. And then finally, I'll mention one more in Acts chapter 3 and verse 26. Notice this. Peter preaching, he says, to you first, speaking to the audience there at Solomon's portico, to you first, Jewish people, God having raised up his servant Jesus, there it is, his servant Jesus, sent him to bless you. How? In turning every one of you from your sins and turning every one of you from your iniquities. That's what Jesus was all about, a servant of God, a servant to all, a servant to the circumcision, a servant to people to turn them away from their sins. And then it says, not only was he made of no reputation by taking the form of a servant, but he came in the likeness of men. Think about what I'm trying to do with this message this morning is this, get you to think from where Jesus came and how low he went for you. How low he went for you. Jesus stepped down, down, down. How far down? No reputation, bond servant, and then coming in the likeness of men. For one who's in heaven, who has no limitations, who's glorified, and all of that, he became enfleshed and came in the appearance of a man. Now, be sure to know that when we say appearance, we're not talking an apparition. We're not saying that he, you know, uh, merely presented himself in some kind of illusory way or some kind of three-dimensional hologram of, of who he was. He really was a man, truly indeed, not just the appearance of one, but this is what, what this means is that he really was a man, really was Amen. And, you know, men were created, according to Hebrews, a little lower than the angels. And yet the Bible says of the angels, let all the angels of God worship him. And so he came down below the rank of angels, down to the rank of men, and even lower, think of it, than Pilate and Herod and the Caesars, and even the regular Jewish people, and he became a servant unto death for their sins. It says he also humbled himself. He took the lowest place. This was exampled at John, in John 13 at the Upper Room Discourse when Jesus did what? He humbled himself. He took a towel and girded himself in a basin and washed their feet. Why would he do that? Because he was the servant of all, the servant of the Jews, the servant of God, and he humbled himself. And I think he's doing that. You know, that passage doesn't, it doesn't limit Jesus' service just to the, to the 12. Everybody needs to have their feet washed. And who does that? Foot washing for you. Spiritually speaking, he bathes you from your sin and then cleanses you daily from that sin that you have accumulated over the course of the day, he washes your feet as well. He humbles himself. And then finally, well not finally, there are two others, but they're connected together. 
Look at verse number 8. He became obedient to death. The point of death, that, that those words, the point of, is, it's appropriate, but they're in italics. He humbled himself and became obedient to death. He learned obedience by the things which he suffered. In experience, not mentally, he knows everything, he's God. He became obedient to death. The author of life laid down his life for you and for me. 1 John 3.16 he gave his life for us, and we ought to also give our lives for our brothers. And that laying down of his life was not just, here's the thing, that could be true and truly said if Jesus came and was born and lived a long life and, and died of old age when he was 85 years old. But that's not how it happened. He wasn't 85, he wasn't 65, he wasn't 45, he wasn't even 35 probably, 33 maybe. In the prime health and strength of life, he was taken in the space of less than 24 hours, perhaps 18 hours, and was beaten and battered and broken and hung upon a cross, and his life expired from him in that instant when he said, it is finished. The death, not just death, but the death of a cross to come from eternal life and glory to a place of death is bad enough, but to come from eternal life and from glory to a place of ignominy and the death on a cross like a criminal? Why? I mean, that's terrible. Because he was taking the place of other criminals, that's why. Other criminals under the divine law of God who broke that law and deserved eternal punishment for it. So summary of this is Christ lowered himself down, down, down. Think of the height of his glory and the depth of his humility and let that sink into your heart. But why did he do it? Why did he do it? Well, the, the activity that he did was not merely an example of humble service. Many who are of the liberal uh, sort in theology would say that he came to give an example of loving and humble service, and so we should do the same. They have forgotten or never learned or denied that the Bible says he did it for far more than just a mere example. Way more than an example of humble service. Matthew 121, the birth announcement of the Lord Jesus, says that he would be given the name Jesus because why? He would save his people from their sins. Mark chapter 10, verse 45, and the Lord is teaching the disciples about service. He says, for even the Son of Man did not come, what? To be served, but to serve and to do what? To give his life a ransom for many. And then, just briefly, I'll go back to Luke's gospel in the passage that the Collins read for us in Luke chapter 2 and verse number 11. A verse that I remember fondly from uh, a niece and a nephew on Naomi's side who recited these verses years ago. And it says in Luke 2, 11, For there is born to you this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. Some translations put that a little bit differently, and the indication is that there is a Savior born for you for you. Think of it, dear ones. The exalted, glorified, utterly deity Christ left behind all of that and came as a man to die for sinners, to die for you, to lower himself lower than you might be, that you might ever be, in order that you might be lifted up to a place greater than the greatest of men in the heavenly kingdom and beyond into an eternity with God and Christ and the Spirit and the angels and the seraphs and the cherubs and the four living creatures. That's why he came, to save his people from their sins, to give his life a ransom for many, and he came to be a Savior for you. John 1.14, we touched on already, he came to dwell among his people. That's what God delights in doing. Do you know that? In the Garden of Eden, he came to 
fellowship with Adam and Eve in the cool of the day, and he promises throughout the Bible, the Old Testament and the New, that he will be our God, and we will be his people, and he will make his dwelling place with us, and we will dwell with him and he with us. God desires, for some reason, that fellowship among his people. And then finally in Titus, why did he do it? The Bible says that he came to redeem a people peculiar and zealous for good works, a people who would, would be redeemed from iniquity and would run towards good works instead of evil. So that's who he was, where, when, what he did, why he did it. Well, who is he and where is he now? Well, he's the same as he's always been. Same as he's always been. In humbling himself, he never gave up to his he never gave up his deity. And just go right back to the first section of our notes and you see everything that he was there, he still is. He's still in the very form of God. He's in heaven. He's glorified. He's equal with God. But also now his place is made clear as Savior. He's been declared to be the Savior of the world. He is God our Savior. He is our Redeemer. Titus 2. He is Lord and Christ. Remember Acts chapter 2, 36, in that opening great sermon of Peter? He says, God has declared him, has made him both Lord and Christ. That's who Jesus is. Acts chapter 17 says he's been appointed as judge. He's Savior, he's Redeemer, he's Lord, he's Christ, he's judge. Romans chapter 1 adds that he is been declared to be the Son of God in power. That doesn't mean that he's suddenly become the Son of God. That means that a declaration has been made by the resurrection of Christ. Look at him. Look at him. He's proven who he was, resurrected, and now the King of creation. Where is he? Well, in that sad story of Stephen, you might remember he looked up and he saw what? Jesus standing at the right hand of God in heaven. That's where he was. And from whence do we await the Savior to come? To transform our lowly bodies to be like his glorious body? We are citizens of heaven and from there he will come and make that transformation. He is there. And think of him glorified. He's in heaven he was before, and he is now once again glorified. He glorified his servant Jesus, Acts chapter 3 and Acts chapter 5. But let me read just two more passages this morning about his glory. Revelation 5, 9. This is where Jesus is. receiving the words of the new song that says, You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals, for you were slain and have redeemed us to God by your blood out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation and have made us kings and priests to our God and we shall reign on the earth. And finally, Philippians 2, 9 through 11. After his steps down, leaving heaven, leaving glory, leaving total honor and majesty for humble servanthood and death, even a death on a cross, it says, therefore God also has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of those in heaven and of those on earth and of those under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. That's our Jesus. That's Christmas. That's the meaning of Christmas, my friends. Christ went from absolute greatness to abject lowliness. Supreme glory to lowly servanthood. He went from eternal blessing to painful death. The passage exhorts us here. What does it say in verse 5? It exhorts us to have that same kind of mindset. From where we are, we think, to where we should be in lowly service. If Christ can go from so high to so low, 
we can certainly move from our already lowly spot to one a little lower in service to the great king. So for this Christmas, let us be filled with gratitude and praise to our God and Savior Jesus Christ who lowered himself in our interest for our favor, for our eternal life. Would you thank him in your heart this morning for what he has done and live a life that matches that profession of thanksgiving? He is worthy because he is equal with God, Jesus Christ. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, how thankful we are for the eternal plan of salvation, for the all-prevailing work of the Lord Jesus Christ, beginning in history as it did on that evening or morn or whenever it was that he was first brought into the world with all the pageantry that he deserved absent, no palace, no fine mattress or sheets, just some cloths to be wrapped in and to be laid in a lowly manger because there was no room for them in the inn. Lord, I pray that the next time when you come, may it be soon, that your accommodations will be far greater than they were the first time. And Lord, we look forward to that day at which every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that you are Lord to the glory of God the Father. All there were the first time were mom and dad, perhaps some strangers and some animals. The next time the world will bow at the coming Christ when they behold him, the king of the universe. Thank you that he first humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even on a cross, so that we could have eternal life. Thank you, Lord, that he stood in our place, that he hung on the cross in our place, that he took the punishment that we deserved ourselves and became that vicarious sacrifice for each and every one of his people. God in heaven, I pray that this realization will lay heavy on our hearts as we think of the great glory from whence he came to the great suffering that he sustained for us. May each and every person here and under the sound of these words come to know or yet know better that Lord Jesus Christ, utterly equal with the Father and the Spirit. And it's to him that we come and give our worship and honor this morning in Jesus' name. Amen.